Hello, and thank you for downloading episode 77 of We Got This with Mark and Hal. Hey, did you know that I am co-hosting yet another podcast on the Maximum Fun Network? I say that like there are more than two. There are just two. It's Tights and Fights with my buddies Mike Eagle and Danielle Radford. We're produced by Julian Burrell. If you love pro wrestling, this is the podcast for you. And if you enjoy We Got This... Why don't you tell your friends so they can enjoy it, too? You can use the link bit.ly forward slash share WGT to let your friends in on all the fun. And now, without any further ado, here's episode 77 of We Got This with Mark and Hal, featuring special guest, WWE superstar, Simon Gotch. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Hal Lublin. And I'm Mark Gagliardi. Since the dawn of humanity, one issue has gone unsettled. With the fate of the world in the balance, we're here to settle, once and for all, Best Movie Villain. That's right, don't worry everyone, we got this. Podcasts should have a theme song. Podcasts should not have a theme song. Yes, they should. No, they shouldn't. They sound good. Yeah, but people are just going to skip past it. Hmm. You know what? You're right. We got this. Hello, Greetings, listeners. People. Oh, look at that. We talked at the same time. Right now, we're Laverne and Shirley trying to get through the door. Shlemiel Shlemazel, Hal. Haas and Pfeffer Incorporated. Uh, so we have a, we have a heavy, heavy job ahead of us today. I don't think it's a job that just you and I can solve. I, I agree with you. Do you solve a job? Is that what you do with jobs? Yeah. You solve a job. Sure. And that's when you're allowed to leave. Every job is a riddle <laughs> and every job is a sphinx. <laughs> So our guest today uh, is uh, someone who I met very recently and turns out is also a big pop culture nerd like you and I are. Oh, good. And he is one half of the WWE tag team known as the Vaude Villains. Uh, and he, is, he and I have started a real burgeoning friendship. His name is Simon Gotch. Simon, welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here. And uh, yes, I would say our, if one thing you can say about our friendship, it is that it is burgeoning. Ooh, that's, the, that is, <laughs> that's all we can say. Most accurate word. That's it. Exactly. Let's not put labels on anything, Simon. We're, we're just getting to know one another. We're not a 12-year-old who just got a label maker for the first time. Uh, <laughs> which I, I guess I'm showing my age by mentioning that because most people today probably don't remember the uh, the, the whole turn dial. And you'd, you'd pull the handle and it would, it would make a label and we all thought it was the greatest thing yeah, ever. Yeah, now they have them with keypads and little digit They like uh, actually print these. Li- what is this? I want that thick blue uh, tape. That when embossed, it turned the letters white. Did you label everything in your house? I did not. Uh, I learned a very valuable lesson from an early episode of The Simpsons. Uh, as you might recall, Bart conning <laughs> the entire town and then winding up stuck down a well, only That's to be true. saved by Sting. <laughs> and I've never wanted to meet Sting personally, so I've avoided that for, for fear that I would have to meet Sting. Because <laughs> I've had I've had nightmares about him ever since seeing uh, Dune. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> I never <laughs> I never thought about one of the fears and dreads of life. You know, aging, not having enough money, meeting Sting. <laughs> Once again, you, you you don't think it's a problem until it happens, and then you're like, oh, wow, I just got Sting. Yeah, you get put in like a tantric trance. Exactly, and you don't want to know what he's going to do to you. All you know it's going to last for like 17 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and he will feel great at the end. We don't know how you oh, will yes. feel. Yeah. <laughs> Probably dirty. Well, every everybody who's listening is going to have a great nightmare tonight where they're just looking up at Sting who's covered in glistening sweat. Uh, which would make him a villain, and which is a good thing that we're we're starting it this way because Valerie Rogers has uh, submitted the suggestion. She wants to know who the best movie villain is. All right, hmm. that is the topic we will tackle today. It seems fitting. Uh, one half of the vaude villains here. It was either that or who's the greatest vaudeville juggler of all time. So, oh, that's obvious. That that that's, that actually goes to uh, to Matt Ricardo. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bluff? Because I feel like no, neither of us will look it up. Oh no, no, that's not a bluff. Matt is a—he's a wonderful magician and a and a uh, and and a juggler. He uh, he actually performs over in Blackpool in England. Uh, oh. he, he's 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 alive today. He's he's actually a relatively young man, oddly enough. But he's a he's a wrestling fan as well as a a, a phenomenal juggler and a magician. There you go. Fantastic. Well, we we're gonna solve two today. Then we got the vaudeville part out of the way. Now we're gonna get the villains. Uh, if I may, gentlemen. We have a lot of work to do. If I may lay down uh, the the criteria and tell me if you would like to make any amendments to this. 
Uh, I've divided right. our villains into four different categories. And we will be picking uh, our best uh, best villain from each category. Then each of the three of us will get to uh, reinstate one of our eliminated villains if you think that someone didn't get a fair shake or if one of the categories had more than uh, its fair share of finalist contenders. Uh, so we will wind up with uh, – that will make it seven at the end. Uh, we'll each eliminate one. And uh, then we'll go from there. And the criteria for judging them are evil, the level of evil in this character, their power in their respective worlds, the merits of the films that they are in, and uh, this is the more esoteric one, their impact on society. Does that sound fair? That sounds fair. That uh, that was not how I was expecting them to be broken up, I'll be very honest with you, but that does sound fair. Okay. How would you break it up? I, it sounds fair to me, too, but I'm curious what – because I couldn't get my head around it. Is there so many? Well, I, I was actually having a conversation slightly earlier um, trying to just sort of get my juices flowing for this uh, particular throwdown, as it were. Mm-hmm. And I realized there that, first of all, if we really want to get deep into a story, anyone can be the villain. Sure. It's all point of view. Oh, yes. I, I remember years ago, it, someone actually made a video of it recently, but I remember years ago stumbling acro- uh, upon an article some kid wrote for a college class or something like that, where he explained in explicit detail how Daniel LaRusso is the actual villain in Karate Kid. <laughs> and he made, a, he, he made a very valid argument. He pointed out that every, every physical conflict, every time... Daniel and Johnny fight in that movie. Daniel is the one that starts it. He is the one that pushes Johnny. He is the one that dumps the water on Johnny every single time. And Johnny actually is relatively nice to him at the, at the beginning of the movie. He offers to teach him karate. He wa- he's like trying to make friends with him. Daniel wants no part of it. And even when it comes time for the tournament, when uh, when uh, John Kreese tells him to sweep the leg, he he looks at him like he's crazy and he tells him, "I can beat the guy legit. You don't need. I don't need to do that." And then when he does it and he he feels bad, and when Daniel actually beats him, he First guy to congratulate him is Johnny. Wow. So that movie is now sad we, in my mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really it's really just about how some jerky kid got everything he want by by being mean to people. <laughs> it's just – and then he goes – in the second film, he goes to Okinawa and bullies those people too. He like, yeah. He's like, hey, your culture is mine now and I'm going exactly. to beat up your champion. Yeah, the, and that's the whole deal is that the guy who – the guy who's like Sato's second in that, that movie – he, he's relatively made. He doesn't need, he doesn't have any problems and his whole life gets ruined because Daniel has to go sticking his nose into everything. It's like, all, all Sato wanted was, was to, to settle things with, with Miyagi and he eventually gets to. Sure. If Daniel did not interject into the, into any of the movies, really, he's kind of the, he's kind of a horrible person. Yeah. And he brought that stupid twisty drum from Epcot. Oh. oh, yeah. I, I tend to think the twisty drum got brought to Epcot and then back, but that's that's just a whole other discussion. That's a different but that, that, college essay altogether. But but that's kind of what I mean. I, and even the if you want to go into a, 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 just in general in a story, we have to consider if a villain is really a villain because of what they do or why they do it, or if they're in a, if they're necessary. Um, there's a wonderful movie called Behind the Mask: The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Uh, the actor's name escapes me, but he uh, he played Herschel on The Walking Dead, mm-hmm. and the whole the whole way the movie's done, it's almost like a mixture between a slasher film and Spinal Tap. So <laughs> it's half mockumentary with this college girl following around this guy who's going to be the next big slasher movie villain in a world where all the slasher movie villains are real people. Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, these are all real guys who really kill. And when they're interviewing the the guy played by I feel awful not being able to remember his name, the actor that played Herschel. He, because he's an older killer, he, they ask him why he does it, and he says, fear. We're in the business of fear. Our job is to provide a diametric opposition to everything good in the world, so that, that good has something to fight. And to a certain extent, that is what a villain's job is, is to give good something to fight, because without something to fight, good just sits on its butt and does nothing. That's true. That's true. By the way, that actor, his name is Scott Wilson. Scott Wilson, thank you very much. I owe him an apology. You know what? I will. He, we name checked him. He, he's he'll be pleased. We we both uh, we both <laughs> went silent uh, for that brief moment because both of us were googling that. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to point that out. Um, that that is the contest now to see who can yeah. Google something fastest. That's that's the real test. Who's the world? I I did a let me Google that for you to Mark yesterday. Oh, I got so mad. Do, are you familiar with that, Simon? Oh, I, I'm not, but I, I understand the basic context would be if someone asks, says something or asks a question, you say, let me Google that. It would probably infuriate them. 
Yes. Because you're not really offering them information. You're just doing something they could do themselves. It's, you're, you're close. It's a site. We've talked about it before on the podcast, but you put a link. At some you, you might ask somebody something that you could look up yourself. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and it might be such as who played uh, Herschel on Walking Dead. And they will take that question and put it into the site, and it, it develops a short link. You send that to the to the person who's asked the question. And when they click it, they see Google come up, and they see the question typed in. And then it says, now, was that so hard? Oh, that is – that is that's the real villain yeah. right there. That you is see why cool. Hal and I that aren't is, friends anymore, oh. Simon. <laughs> that was the end of it. I – that, 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 there's usually a line in the sand for most friendships. That's a that's a fair yeah. one. <laughs> it's really it's it's not a very far walk that he gets to go on if that's the line in the sand for a friendship. <laughs> yes. Once again, it's not always about the it's not about the distance. It's about the depth. You know, it's similar with a villain. It's not necessarily about how much power they wield, but rather how they wield it. Okay. Would you so in our in our criteria, uh, an evil being one of our criteria. That I am sure will come up, uh, how they wield that evil, if, if they use their evil and their power to its fullest, or if they avoid that. Um, yeah. but I think, no, no, please. I was going to say, that, I was gonna say that's, that's pretty much a fair justification of it, because obviously you can't really compare someone like a Darth Vader, who can crush your throat with the mere motion of his hand without even touching you, to like, say, a, uh, Stan from, uh, The Professional. Where uh, Gary Oldman's character, Correct. where he's clearly a thoroughly evil human being who does horrible things. I mean, he shotguns a child. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he has no he has no morals. Yes. Yeah. But the only thing he crushes is a pill with his teeth. Exactly. He he can't. He doesn't have real powers. But at the same time, Vader ultimately was a good person at the beginning of, of his lifeline, and again at the end of it, it's the middle that he that was bad. So you could argue he didn't really get as evil as he could have. That's true. Um, that is true. All right, let's delve into these four categories, if I may. Uh, what we have right now are sci-fi and fantasy villains, horror monsters, human criminals, and corrupt authority figures. Okay. Where would you guys like right. to start? I'll yield to the guest. Uh, I say we start with probably the uh, the widest topic, which would be the sci-fi. Great. That's, All right. Uh, and please tell me if I've missed any on this list uh, of the big ones. Contenders. Real contenders, guys. Uh, I know, Hal, you probably want Hal 9000 on there just because it has your name. Um, <laughs> I don't. I want to be a good guy. <laughs> uh, here's who I have so far. Darth Vader, Lord Voldemort, the Wicked Witch of the West, Sauron, Agent Smith from the Matrix series, the Joker, any incarnation of the Joker, the Evil Queen from Snow White, the Alien from Alien, Aliens, Alien Resurrection, and all of them, uh, Predator, and Khan. Have I missed any big guns that could be contenders? Huh. Well, not not necessarily. Uh, not none that are popping to mind any anyway. Uh, I I suppose we could always throw in just in a general sense of villainy. Uh, whoever greenlit the film, the Love Guru, starring Mike Myers. But I don't think that really- <laughs> <laughs> that can go in any category, so I suppose that, that this is acceptable. Yeah, those, those I, would that be choices. corrupt authority figures or human criminals? Because I assume it was a human. That's a crossover. Oh, yeah. If anything, that, that that definitely treads the line between corrupt human and just outright criminal. I think we just solved this one. <laughs> Let's just throw this list away. We oh, figured God. it out, guys. We got the world's best juggler and the guy that made the love guru. Next topic. <laughs> um, oh, actually. Actually, there is one I would like to throw in there because okay. uh, we we said Sauron, and I, I I know we probably want to limit it to one per series, but Saruman technically was slightly worse than than Sauron because he actually betrayed everybody. Yeah, I think that's I mean, a good. I think that's a fair one to put in there, and I would also put in Emperor Palpatine, who is the the the, the truly evil guy behind Darth Vader. Yeah, see, so that, I mean, we could, but then again, we also have to consider the list would be ever expanding, so maybe we limit it to those two editions. Just that sounds good for the sake of sincerity. They are, they are, uh, epic, uh, global franchise films, so they can each get two on the list. Sure. All right. So, uh, let's break these down. It's, uh, we're going to come out of here with one, and we're probably going to get all three of our, uh, elimination put back in names. I do want to add one more in. I sorry, I thought of one. God, Hal, not in front of our guest, Simon, Mark. <laughs> I think that neither of you will fault me when I say that we should add Loki to this list. 
Uh, I might. I, really? Oh, Loki. Yes. Be, Loki is great. Loki is a is he his not his evilness factor is not high enough. He's just a screw uh, up. And ultimately, he's almost too sympathetic from his. Uh, I mean, I mean, he's adopted. He had a he had a rough childhood. Sure. And and considering that there are so many characters who have that same sort of uh, setup, who go to much worse lengths. Mm-hmm. I mean, he just went for world domination. In, in the grand scheme of things, he didn't really want to hurt anyone. He just wanted to rule the world. Yeah, he and really he just only, did only, dumb only things to do it. Whether it was letting in the frost giants or letting in an entire army through a hole in the sky, like he always got in over his head. Tr- mm. True, but he is he is one of those people. Who is driven by power. And I think we're going to find out uh, over the course of this list that uh, that is something that a lot of these villains share. So he's definitely a more complex character. But I mean, you could say Magneto is a great villain, but also is a highly sympathetic character because he's a Holocaust survivor. So everything he does, even if it's the wrong thing, it comes from, from a real hurt that, that we can all identify with. And, and this is a challenge on the subject though, is that we have to consider the motivation of the character and and sort of what they're doing and why. I mean, if you really if you want to look at the xenomorph, uh, the alien, technically speaking, that creature isn't particularly evil. That's true. I mean, if you if you really break it down, it's an animal doing what its natural instinct is to do, which is to breed and eat. That that's all it's doing. Which is actually the reason I've, I eliminated another uh, another villain from the list. It would have been later on, uh, and that is the Jaws from Shark. The shark from Jaws. The Jaws from Shark. Well, you guys well, remember that shark Bond is a great movie. movie. Shark Un- unrelated. Uh, <laughs> Jaws came back for. Uh, that was four. I think was it, was it part four? Yeah, Revenge. That's it. That was the one. <laughs> but but that's all. But I mean, if you consider it, any of the animal villains, really, we, we're breaking it down. It's their motivation is very base. I mean, they're not really monsters. They're just you know, in this if. It's like with Predator, even then you look the, the the alien from or the the Predator, I guess from Predator. Mm-hmm. It's just hunting. It has no moral. There, there's no morality to what it's doing. It's not. It doesn't feel like it's. You know, it's not trying to rule the world. It's just. It's like I want a challenge. I want something to hunt. I mean, you could argue it's really the. It's similar to uh, Arnold Vosloo and um, Lance Henriksen from the Jean Claude Van Damme classic Hard Target. Oh, I forgot those two. <laughs> They're, they're bad guys, absolutely, but if you think about it, they're hunting people for sport and facilitating the hunting of people for sport. In the grand scheme of things, I mean, I would say Loki's definitely more evil than them. I mean, they're, they're, they're not burning villages, they're not killing children, they're like, okay, we have, we have a, a, a business we've designed that admittedly causes people to die directly. But at the, at the same time, they're not necess- they're not doing this to, you know, random individuals on the street. They're offering people they into they're they're inviting people into a very dangerous game that they probably won't win. Well, but it's you know. hold on a second. I think you're I think you're you're angling this a little too hard. We are talking about two guys who basically take homeless vets and then let rich people kill them. Like they're not given really much of a chance to survive. True, but they're given more of a chance to say something like hostile, where they're literally tied down and put in a position where they're just going to be mutilated. I mean, those guys at least are free to move. And as we saw in, in, uh, the, uh, gentleman that, uh, that they actually meet, I can't remember that he's not, not, uh, Yancey Butler's father, but the other guy, uh, he actually takes down a couple of the hunters. So clearly it's, it's not as even, but it's definitely more even than, than say something where it's just a straight up torture scene, you know? <laughs> this is, this is what I like to call Obi-Wan reasoning. Like in, in Return of the <laughs> Jedi, when Obi-Wan is like, I, I, Vader did betray and murder your father from a certain point of view. If you say from a certain point of view after any statement, then there is somebody who will go, you know what? You're right. I never thought about it that way. You can reason your way out of anything. Therein lies the key. That is, that is the, the whole goal is to reason your way out of anything. That way you don't have to take responsibility for it. Thus, even if you're a villain, you get away with everything. So if I may, if we are considering, uh, if we are considering animal instinct and less than, uh, less than full, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Cognizance or less than, uh, a full soul inside a thing or a person. Uh, do you guys think then that we could eliminate the alien, the mother alien from aliens, uh, predator and agent Smith from the matrix movies as he is simply a program? 
I I would say yes, honestly, right off the bat, those okay. three. Um, the predator really, as I've said before, he's just hunting. He's he has no more. There's no morality to what he's doing. He doesn't. He's not trying to accomplish anything other than sport. And you could argue, I mean, it's from our perspective, uh, going back to that, it's cruel because he's killing humans. But from his perspective, he's just hunting game. I mean, it'd be the same way we would view if we were hunting deer or elk. Yeah. So, uh, when I was looking through lists online of uh, the great movie villains, uh, this is actually on the uh, AFI top 50 villains list uh, from the movie Bambi, man. <laughs> Not a person. It is simply a gunshot. So the concept of humans are considered one of the 50 greatest villains of all time. <laughs> Aren't they also the uh-huh. villains of Planet of the Apes? Well, uh, I do believe they are. They're the villains of a lot of things. Yeah, well, in general, I mean, we if you really Wally. generalize, if it's just humans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're a real problem. We are. All right. While we're eliminating things from this, uh, while we're trying to narrow down sci-fi and fantasy villains, uh, we do have two right now that we've got Vader and Palpatine and Sauron and Saruman. Let's pull one from each of those into the final, or one from each of those uh, eliminated in this round. You, uh, Mark, I do have one question for for a villain. Um, does Gozer belong in this group? Ooh, that Ooh. is... That is a good one. I, I actually say Gozer a, would go into this group. Yeah. Gozer still, would go into this group. And Gozer is one that I missed, and I cannot believe I missed Gozer. Yeah, no, but I'm Gozer putting Gozer go- in right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty – that's a pretty – it meets a lot of criteria. Seems purely evil, has been around for a long time, wants to conquer the world and, and destroy it, is from a classic film. So could be in the running. And sure. definitely definitely has one of the – Lowest levels of respect for human life. Because the one question Gozer asks is, are you a god? And when the answer is no, then die. Yeah. Yep. Your, her <laughs> threshold for, um, like, there, that's a pretty high bar to set. Yeah. <laughs> I, and, and she gives him the option to lie. I, as, as, as Winston points out, if someone asks if you're a god, say yes. She of actually course. gave them the chance to lie, and they opted not to, and they suffered for it. Yeah, she's sort of like the the <laughs> spiritual embodiment of online dating. You have an option to not tell the truth <laughs> and continue on, or she can discover who you really are, and then you will be destroyed by a giant marshmallow man. Well, this yeah, is but if you if you put in your online profile is a god, people are probably not going to swipe you, right? <laughs> I don't well, know how this works. That or they'll think you have a great sense of humor. But as I've always said, it, it, when it comes to dating, I know this is off topic, put your worst foot forward. Really? <laughs> yes, because here's the thing. If you put your worst foot forward and this person still likes you, then you know you can never do any worse than that. So you're, you're, you're set. If sure. you put your best, if you put your best foot forward, you've got, there's a lot of like, upkeep involved. It's like on the first date, go out without, if you're a woman, go out without makeup, wear a, a, the worst t-shirt you own and a pair of baggy sweatpants. If you're a guy, I say jorts, jorts and flip flops. Oh, jorts! Really? <laughs> so and and just set the standard so low that you can only win this person over with your personality, and thus they you can find out if they actually care about you and like you and can be around you, or if because ba- base physical attraction that's always going to be a thing, but at a certain point you are going to see this person outside of that that little box they've painted and built up around themselves to make them to look as well as they possibly can. So really, if you step outside of that and you go, this is what I've, this is the worst thing I can ever offer you. I can never offer you anything worse than this. And they're like, okay, you know what? I'm okay with that. You know, as an added, <laughs> as an added bonus, you look like a group therapy outing in public. Exactly. Just hanging out. I, I, this is actually makes sense that my first date with my now wife of uh, almost nine years, I was at the time, losing weight and so i was drinking a lot of water and when you drink a lot of water we all know you have to pee a lot so i would say during our first date i went to the bathroom no less than five times over the course of 90 minutes i just kept getting up and going like so she could have thought anything he has a drug did she think you were going into the bathroom and slapping yourself in the face going come on hal come on hal you can do this I wouldn't blame her if she thought that probably would have been – It's the, that is one of the best things you can think somebody is going to the restroom to do repeatedly. Well, well no. The, the drug thing would be the obvious one. I, th- I can't remember the exact stand-up routine, but there was a, uh, a Robin Williams act where he keeps going off stage. This was maybe in the late 70s. It was an HBO special. And when they asked him what he was doing many years later, he said, oh, I was doing cocaine. 
Every time I went off stage, I was doing cocaine. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That explains yeah. why he was, like, climbing the balcony in one of those early specials. Pretty much. It, it was – so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's not – and that's probably not something you want – that's not the impression you want to give during a first date is that you have a drug problem. No, you sure Especially don't. if you don't. Especially if you don't. If you have one, then it's probably a good thing to tell the person so you can get help. But if you don't have <laughs> one, then that's – it's a lot well, of Well, also, that goes into the list of, uh, hey, I'm giving you my worst self. Exactly. <laughs> I have a drug problem. Do you want to stay for dessert? <laughs> That's fair. Uh, That's a- all right. Let's get back to the list. <laughs> sure. Uh, all right. So here is, uh, once again, Darth Vader, Voldemort, Wicked Witch of the West, Sauron, Saruman, uh, the Joker, the Evil Queen, Khan, Palpatine, Loki, and Gozer. This is our biggest list by far of, of all of these. Okay. All right. So between Palpatine and Vader, I it's got to be Vader, right? I I would actually go with Palpatine. Really, really. Well, if we if we look at Palpatine versus Vader, Vader's big sin was being easily manipulated and doing bad things because of it. If if you look at his history from his whole time as Anakin Skywalker, I know that means we have to acknowledge the uh, the first three movies. The the one to three trilogy, and that's usually a sin unto itself. But <laughs> if you look at Darth Vader going from Anakin Skywalker to Darth Vader and then back to Anakin when the helmet comes off at the end of Jedi, he basically was a dumb kid who fell in love, was easily manipulated by a politician who himself had pretty evil intentions to dominate the entire universe. And then when he realized what was happening and he saw an opportunity to redeem himself, he immediately killed Palpatine. Whereas Palpatine, there's no, there's no redemption. There's no point in his storyline where he's a good guy. There's, there's nothing where you can go, well, at one time, you know, Palpatine was really nice. No, he was pretty much a monster his entire life. He manipulated Vader, got him to do horrible things, kill his family. I mean, Vader is really a bad person directly because of Palpatine's involvement. And you could argue that without Palpatine, Vader might never have gone that far. He might have still ended up losing his life, but he certainly wouldn't have been to the extent of him murdering children as he did. That's true. I mean, Palpatine did engineer the the extinction of the Jedi for all intents and purposes outside of the few who were able to escape from him. He betrays the entire uh, what is it? The entire Galactic Senate, I guess, was the was the name of the governing body in in those prequels. And he he relentlessly hunts down and tries to crush anybody who defies his power, including happily murdering previous. Um, uh, what is it, not Darth? It's not Darth Sidious, is it? Is it Darth Sidious? Darth well, Darth Sidious is the character that he has. He has basically as Anakin kill him, knowing that uh, no. Anakin's going to take his place. No, that was uh, Count Dooku. Uh, Count Dooku. Darth, City, Darth Sidious, Sidious is technical- was the uh, robot with a cold, right? No, no, that was uh, that General was uh, that was General Grievous. Darth Sidious is, in fact, if I recall correctly, that is actually um, Emperor Palpatine. Yes, you're right. That was his. Oh, that was right. his. That was his Sith title was Darth Sidious. Which I, am I the only like? That's one of those ones where like, okay, his, his it's like three letters off from Insidious. It, did no one know this? This was a bad guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> His disguise was pulling a hood slightly forward. It didn't even cover his whole face. Like that's this didn't strike and wrinkles. No, uh, well, technically they were burns, but that's yeah. <laughs> those were force lightning burns. Wrinkle yeah. burns. By that's the way, Wrinkle Burns is my favorite Charles Dickens character. <laughs> <laughs> now you also have to though realize we got it. We added to this list the impact on society as one of the criteria. Yeah. And there's an argument for Darth Vader because uh, how many kids dress up each Halloween as Palpatine? Uh, well, not as many as dress up as Darth Vader. True. Vader had the greater impact on society. But at the same time, he uh, – that, that, that becomes kind of a sticky issue because if we're going to – when we're getting to – we'll obviously get to Freddy Krueger later. Mm-hmm. If the char- – it, it almost begs the question – is it as bad that he had the, he had the greater impact on society? Yes, but he you could also argue he was less of a villain. He com- he committed less evils. So is it as bad that, that he true. had that impact on society? I am willing to. Uh, I am. I'm just pointing that out. I am willing to, in a surprise move, <laughs> eliminate Darth Vader early on in the process. Now he could still come back as one of our eliminated characters. Of course. Um, yeah. So we're keeping Palpatine. Yep. How are you comfortable with that? I- 
I am. I was sitting here thinking, well, the, the really the, the most terrible thing that Darth Vader does is cuts off his son's hand, which yeah. this was a long time ago. And we all know that the value of children to society has changed as we've moved to present time. There wouldn't have been a children's crusades uh, 20 years ago, but it certainly happened centuries ago. So who even knows eons ago in a galaxy far, far away how terrible it was for kids. That could have been like like the equivalent of like dinner and a movie and some ice cream afterwards. So Vader, Vader, <laughs> I will allow him to step aside in favor of Palpatine, who is the true – he's the true evil – of of the original trilogy for sure. All right, I'm I'm hitting the delete button. I'm hitting highlight and delete. Oh. We've made it through three. We've got 31 characters to get through, okay. fellas. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so Sauron or Saruman are either of these going to win win it all? Sauron. If any, if either of them could win it all, and, and if we're going on the you know who is doing who's bidding. Sauron is the the ultimate evil in this. Saruman is do and this is in Lord of the Rings for those who don't know. Uh Saruman is doing Sauron's bidding, correct? True. That is correct, yes. Another Christopher Lee role as a as an evil flunky in a sci-fi or fantasy film. Well, Christopher Lee is a he had a tremendously evil look for a man who actually fought very valiantly for the British during World War II. I did not know that about him. Oh, I, I, there's a the scene when he uh, does the stabbing in I can't remember which one of the Lord of the Rings movies it is, but uh, apparently Peter Jackson told him, "I need you to imagine the sound a man would make when he's stabbed." And he said, "Oh, I don't need to imagine that. I know what it is." Oh. Oof! Good oh, God. God. He he worked for the OSS during World War II, and basically that's more or less what James Bond that those sort of actions were what his whole story was based on was. The OSS. So it's to put it in perspective, the the, the man was Dracula and James Bond. One, <laughs> yeah. and and what only one of those is fictitious. That's that's the scary part. He he legitimately <laughs> did these these things that you would think of it being in a James Bond movie. And so so that's yeah. I also feel like knowing that about him, if he was on set and someone was like complaining that the water wasn't cold enough. You would get from Christopher Leah, are you kidding me? <laughs> I have seen death. Um, yes. That's very true. All right. Yeah. Um, now we've got some more. Let's think about it. It could take us a while if we're eliminating uh, one at a time, each of these. Let's think about who from this, uh, who are the standouts in this sci-fi and fantasy villains category? Well, we have, again, Voldemort, the Wicked Witch, Sauron and Saruman, the Joker, the Evil Queen, Khan, Palpatine, Loki, and Gozer. Who jumps out to you at the top of that list? Top of the list for me is, um, I'm going to go with the, the Joker. I, the Joker I, is, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I was sitting here looking at this list thinking, these are all terrible beings, but then I think about that particularly the Heath Ledger Joker. And Joker is interesting because there's so many different versions of him that exist. But that one in particular, where it's a guy who comes out of nowhere, who you like really never get a full understanding of, of, uh, what it is that he actually wants because he sort of doesn't want anything. He wants everything destroyed. Like he, he has no, he burns a giant pile of money. Yeah. Um, it's chill. And, he, and he has a he has a slight advantage, admittedly, over a lot of the other characters, is that there's so many incarnations of the Joker, both in cinema and comic books, cartoons, mm-hmm. video games, where it's it's almost hard to differentiate one from the other. So you can't really you can't really separate the character you've seen so many times in in different formats. It, it's all the Joker, and that that does, like I said, gives him a very unfair advantage in this category. But moreover, it, even if we just look at the Heath Ledger version of him, the idea is that it's at the end of the day, it's all a joke to him. It is. That's the whole point. It's and funny. That is terrifying. Yeah, yeah, that he he just wants to laugh at something horrible. It's just that it, it's actually a line from the uh, from the animated series from the uh, uh, Mad Love, I believe, is the episode title, um, where he says that right after he uh, knocks Harley or as he's beating up Harley Quinn. Actually, it's pretty it's pretty awful. He knocks her out of a window and he says, "You forgot what I told you a long time ago. You're always taking hits from people that don't get the joke." Wow. 
And that's it, even in even in the confines of the Dark Knight. That's the whole deal: is that no one gets the joke. The joke is that he's able to manipulate all these people. He even says it. Look at the look at the chaos I caused with a few bullets and a couple of drums of gasoline. Yeah, but now that you mention t- to him, he laments that no one gets the joke. To a couple of comedians, you just made him a sympathetic character. <laughs> Well, being sympathetic doesn't necessarily make you not a good villain. That, and that's, that's one that's of those things where when we, if we talk about villainy, it's hard to decide is a, is a, is it better to be a sympathetic villain, one that people can understand or one that people can't understand? Michael Myers, who I'm, once again, I'm sure we'll talk about later. I'll throw this mm-hmm. in here because one, I actually don't like Michael Myers, the character, mm-hmm. as much as I like Donald Pleasance, uh, Sam Loomis, his doctor. His characterization of Michael, the way he talks about him is what I like. The, w- the way he explains him, because Michael ultimately is just a guy walking around stabbing people. There's not really a whole lot else to him. Right. As, as the series went on, they tried to add stuff with the whole Thorn trilogy and three, four, and five, mm-hmm. or, or four, five, and six. It, there, there were other things, but the initial character is literally just a kid in a mask killing people. I mean, he's an 18 year old kid. That's the odd part is that in the first movie, he's relatively young. Right. But, but, the way Donald Pleasance talks about him, when he talks about the, the, the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes, and you know how this, you know, he, he spent five years trying to reach him and another five trying to make sure he never got out. That's what, and he's unsympathetic. There's no, cause there's no cause. But, but that raises the question, like I said, it's some characters are sympathetic and that's almost why you feel bad because you know what they're doing is so far beyond their own control. It's what they feel they have to do. Uh, Ozymandias in Watchmen. He's the bad guy. But he's the bad guy but who says he is doing the it. only way he can save the world, the only way he can fix what's wrong, is if he does this horrible thing that's going to cost millions of people their lives. And that's, you know, right, a, right. a great burden for anyone want to, to want uh, to take. So let's move on then to horror monsters. Are we all agreeing that the Joker is coming out of that? Since you mentioned Michael Myers. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think the Joker, we all are kind all of in agreement with that all one. Right. So that's top choice. So uh, before we move on to Michael Myers and the horror great monsters, uh, do we, we we can all say that the Joker is the one that is officially coming out of the sci-fi and fantasy villains category? Yes. Yes. Lovely. Uh, all right. So now we're moving on to horror monsters. And uh, these are the five that uh, – the big five, I would put them as the ones that popped up uh, – repeatedly in online lists of the best films. Really, uh, this show is kind of like the Huffington Post. I just aggregate. I don't think of any of this stuff. Uh, but in aggregating all of this, um, we've got Freddy, Jason, Michael Myers, Leatherface, and coming from the old school, good old Dracula. And, and Mark, we should probably throw Frankenstein in there since he won our best classic movie monster episode. That is very true. I would like. Uh, I eliminated him because of his sympathetic nature, but then now realizing that, uh, according to Simon here, all of these guys are sympathetic, which scares me about our guest. Hal, don't let him hear you. Oh no, I can tell you that. Hear me. I can tell you the one right off the bat that's completely unsympathetic. Go ahead. There is one. There is one character you named who is absolutely unsympathetic in every way, shape, and form. Freddy Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Freddy. That like that's the one where we don't really think about it. Because particularly as the series went on, it became more comedic. Right. Mm-hmm. But let us not mince words. Freddy Krueger was a pedophile who murdered children. Yep. There, there's nothing good about him. There, there's no <laughs> like, there, there's no sympathetic side to that. It's like, oh, well, all these people gathered around him and, and they burned him alive. Yes, he was a pedophile who murdered yeah. children. <laughs> yeah. There's a very good reason that the town murdered him. Yeah. Th- this was... This wasn't like he was accused of it and he didn't really do it. It wasn't like, you know, there was, there, there was, there was no point where they were like, oh, well, it turned out he never actually did anything. It was, you know, some kids thought it would be funny to make up a story about the school janitor or whatever. No, no, he absolutely did all of this. Yep. And then he, and his response to it is, oh yeah, you're going to kill me. Well, I'm going to sell my soul to three creepy fish monsters and then I'm going to come back and murder all of your children in their dreams. Yeah. He's pretty terrible. Yeah. He, there, there's nothing good about him. Like that's so. Can anyone else come out of this category but Freddy? No. No. Wow. I, that was fast. You know, yeah, you, that w- but you make a great point, Simon, which is that how comedic the films got as they move forward. It's like, oh, look, Freddy's coming out of the TV in, in Dream Warriors, or uh, I think it was four or five where he puts the, creates the video game for the kid who's really yeah. into Nintendo and kills mm-hmm. him. 
And, and was it Dream Warriors that also had the marionette made out of the guy's veins? Yes. Like, these that are was, insane. Oh, yeah. And, and the whole thing was, as the series went on, Freddy was the only really reoccurring character. Mm-hmm. The, or the, the one that appeared in every movie. And at the end of the day, that's the one kids dressed up as at Halloween. That's the one people remember. Um, a, a friend of mine, uh, she makes bone jewelry, actually. She lives up in Gainesville. She told me a story one time that when she was a kid, because movies were popular when she was a kid, she'd like... <laughs> She taped uh, like what, like kitchen knives to her fingers on her way to school. She got in a huge amount of trouble for it. But it was that sort of thing where <laughs> as, as a child, she did not see what was wrong with Freddy Krueger. Right. Because he's the one making the witty quips and with the funny jokes and, you know, he's the one getting, shall we say, propped up by the series as, as the real centerpiece. And he is an absolutely abominable creature. Like there's nothing about him you can even – even the uh, – the I I don't recall the character's name in Glorious Bastards the uh, the detective Landa La, uh, Landa I think it's ha- yeah. Hans Hans Landa is his name yeah he justifies his existence by saying I'm a detective that yeah. is what I do mm-hmm. he's like I'm not a Jew hunter I it's nothing so crass I'm a detective I find people who are hiding just like any other detective as much as he's a horrible person he even he has a justification for what he's doing. There's no justification for Freddy. He doesn't even try and defend what he does. He just does it. Yeah. Well, and the, yeah, if you, you, I guess if it's, you can keep saying why with most of these villains and get far enough back that something is forgivable. Right. Uh, with Freddy, you get, you ask why he does this, why this, why this. And the further you go back in the why, the end point that you get to is, well, the family, the, the, the town killed me. Why? Uh, cause I molested and murdered children. The end. You're done. Yeah. And he almost became like a Bugs Bunny later on. He'd be like, oh, yeah. you like ice cream? I'm going to crush you with a cherry. And everybody would be like, ha ha, <laughs> Freddy's at it again. I completely forgot the fact that he's a pedophile who murdered children. So Freddy definitely, he's coming out of this category. There's, there's nobody can touch him. Mm-hmm. Now, are we talking about, uh, Robert England Freddy? Or are we talking about Rorschach Freddy? You know damn well there's only one Freddy. Yeah, please. <laughs> come on. Don't even. All right. So Freddy makes it out of Horror Monsters. Uh, is now a good time, since we're halfway through, for us to uh, take a little break? Yes. Uh, let's Instead of villains, let's hear a couple of heroes who do podcasts on the Max Fun Network. Going into a Bullseye interview, I know that it's somebody who does amazing work, but it's, it's an actual conversation, and you know, sometimes it gets real. No, but my mother, I remember my. I remember when I got, <laughs> this is going to become a therapy session very quickly. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm in therapy. That was a great <laughs> interview. Bullseye. Creators you know, creators you need to know. Find it at MaximumFun.org or wherever you get podcasts. I'm Hal Lublin. I'm Danielle Radford. I am Michael Eagle. And we are the hosts of Tights and Fights, Maximum Fun's newest podcast dedicated to all things wrestling. We'll be talking about Sasha Banks, the women's revolution, Sasha Banks, the brand split, and Sasha Banks' wigs. And we'll also be talking about wrestler fashion. Some wrestlers wear too many clothes. Some wrestlers don't wear enough clothes at all. And I'll be doing impressions of all your favorite wrestlers. New episodes Thursdays on Maximum Fun or wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, yeah, dig it. Tights and Fights Podcast. Tights and Fights. Wasn't that nice to take a break and finally hear about some good in the world? I know. Happiness. And now we go back to villainy. I feel cleansed, really. That was, that was, I think I, I think I enjoyed that the most of anyone. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> there are towels over there. <laughs> I didn't As sweat you that just much. been baptized. Uh, the, the tears of joy. Just to, uh, nice. all right. So our last two categories are human criminals and corrupt authority figures. We are leaving the monster realm and we are now focusing strictly on humans. Okay. So here are the human criminals on this list. As always, please feel free to let me know any that I missed. And if you don't get them, I'm sure Twitter will when this episode airs. Uh, so our human criminals on the list. Cruella DeVille, Norman Bates, Hannibal Lecter, Blofeld, Goldfinger, Joan Crawford, Alex Forrest from Fatal Attraction, and Hans Gruber. 
I have one I need to throw in there who might possibly be a huge oversight. Okay. Oh, please. Henry. Michael Rooker from Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Portrait of a Serial Killer. Oh. That's a yeah. pretty good one. Is he a – was that character based on an actual human? No. Which makes a lot of what happens in that movie even more disturbing. But, yeah, that it was some writer went, hey, this will be cool. Yeah. Um, I want to throw another one in, which is John Doe from Seven. Oh, yes. Excellent. Uh, now let's uh, now now that they've all gotten their honorable mention. Okay, who do we think is going to come out of this? Who are the contenders for gold, silver, and bronze? Who's standing on the Olympic uh, on the Olympic pedestals of villainy from this category? Hmm. Well, I, I'm a huge Die Hard fan, so I I think Hans Gruber is a pretty great villain. I would give Gruber a definite uh, – he's definitely up there. Uh, mm-hmm. My only objection to him is, is the ultimate realization that he is just doing it for the money. Right. It, make, it, it is weak. I watched a movie the other night where that was the case and I was like, oh. Yeah. It's disappointing. You want a villain with uh, – even Jeremy Irons in the third one was doing it to avenge. No. He was oh. doing it for the money too. He oh, made everybody right. think it was about his brother. It's a family he, problem. Yeah, he, he – that is what uh, Bruce Willis says, uh, and it, it even goes back to the what was it the uh, the Michael Myers thing? Just a random side note. Mm-hmm. If, if you if you really consider it, that there's one true villain in that film series, and that's Jamie Lee Curtis, because all Michael wanted Michael wanted one person. <laughs> Everyone who dies in that movie series died because they got between him and Jamie Lee Curtis. She could have done the Spock, yeah. you know, put the needs of the many before the needs of the few, but she was selfish and. A lot of people suffered for it. <laughs> so she's really kind of a human villain. But in, in, in this, yeah, it's, it's – with Hans Gruber, he's a good villain. My only objection is, like I said, it, it's money-driven. It, it's it's why uh, – because I looked through a couple of the lists as well and I remember Gordon Gecko came up from, from uh, Wall Street and I thought he's not really a villain. He's a businessman. You can say he's <laughs> – well, it's true though. You no, can, you can right. say – you could say he's immoral, yes. You could say he's corrupt, yes. You could say what he's doing is illegal, yes. But in the grand scheme of things, what he does is very much a part of American society. What someone like Hans Gruber does well, is criminal. It's not really a part of American society to set yourself up as a faux terrorist so you can rob a bank, basically. Uh, but yeah, that, that's my only real objection to Hans. I mean, yeah. I, I would say similarly to Creole DeVille, all she wanted was a jacket. You know what? You're you're the one who goes uh, who says she does take joy. Yeah, the real villain is Charlie Brown because he keeps making Lucy bend down. It's bad for her knees and back to hold that football. <laughs> no, though I I will say that part of the reason I brought up Henry oh, is geez. oh no no I will I will defend Lucy uh, as the day is long because you know what <laughs> she's a psychiatrist. She, she is. She brought us so much joy throughout the years. <laughs> she did. As, as Mel Brooks said, tragedy is when I fall in an open manhole and break my leg. Comedy is when you fall in an open manhole and die. That's so, true. <laughs> but uh, part of the reason I brought up Henry um, is because if you if you look at the the story arc of the character in the movie, he is completely reprehensible the whole way through. He's an awful creature who does horrible things to everyone around him. And in one of the – it's an, an obvious twist, but one of the more brilliant ones you're going to see that's obvious – they set it up. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for anyone who hasn't seen the movie. Where I have not seen it. Well, the, the whole but setup towards please. the end, he uh, he he makes friends with this guy who's a complete reprobate. They commit a bunch of crimes together, ranging from rape and murder, theft, all sorts of things. And at the end of it, um, he kills the guy when he's attacking his own sister. Uh, he the the his friend quote unquote sexually assaults his own sister, and in the process of that, Henry beats the guy to death. And him and the sister leave together. And they set it up as it's almost going to be like, oh, well, I guess we found each other now and, you know, everything's going to be okay. And he tells her, yeah, just go to bed. Everything will be fine. And when they cuts to the next morning, Henry pulls the car over, pulls a very heavy looking suitcase out of the car and dumps it at the roadside. And he's by himself. Uh, so uh, it, it's almost like that, that swerve of, oh, maybe he's found his humanity. It's like, nope, he's a monster. He's a monster. He set this girl up and then killed her and then threw her body by a roadside. I was always, uh, I never even saw that movie in its entirety. I only saw clips from it, but that and, uh, every other character he ever played has made me permanently terrified of Michael Rooker. <laughs> He's a very nice guy. My, my older brother does promotional work for Troma Films 
And oh. uh, he, he's met Rooker multiple times at different conventions and uh, AFM and things like that. And he says he's a very nice guy, but he's absolutely creepy. It's, it's just unavoidable. He's also an alum of my acting school. Shout out to the the theater school at DePaul University. There you go. And I have seen him in a lot of movies, and that is my connection to him. Go Team <laughs> Rooker. Well, All if right. You- um, we've got two. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and if you really look at it, maybe that's a testament to the character as well as to his skill that this is a guy who played one role that for the rest of his career makes him creepy to everyone who sees him and anything else he does. Yeah. Like, go back and watch watch Henry Porter, a serial killer, then watch the first season of Walking Dead and tell me he is not way creepier now that you've seen that. It's it's hard not to do. Yeah, but also it's his face and voice. You can't imagine that face and voice doing the Jerry Maguire monologue from the end of the movie. Oh. Coming in on Renee Zellweger. Unless you do want to hear Renee Zellweger say, you had me at hello. <laughs> I I feel more like she would have screamed in terror and run. <laughs> but that's, that, that's part of the impact of it, I suppose. It, and that's the thing. It really is him. It's not just the character. It's his performance. Yeah. And in Re- Renee Zellweger's defense, she doesn't have to outrun him. She just has to outrun everybody else from that book club that was getting together at that house. Exactly. When he busts in. <laughs> that is a really – that is an odd thing to remember about that movie. I did not recall that, that they were having a book club. <laughs> that it was a book club. Was... Well, I remember everything yeah. about it. That is my gift and curse. To remember everything about Jerry Maguire. <laughs> to remember everything. I, I oh. dubbed the – Did you? Is that one that you asked for, for a monk, from a monkey's paw and then you didn't realize it was also going to be a curse? Like you thought it was just going to be a blessing? Yeah. The monkey's paw just said, all right. There wasn't even anything about it afterwards, so I guess yeah, was, there was no ironic comeuppance. It was just yeah, no, it, it knew full well you'd wind up remembering all of Jerry Maguire, and it was like that's punishment enough. We don't need to. We don't need to do anything <laughs> yeah, else. We've done it. <laughs> um, all right, there's two in this category though. Henry is excellent. Henry is great. I, I will again argue the uh, impact on society. Um, angle just because we're looking for uh, maybe we maybe we don't. I don't know. Uh, one criteria is their iconicness. Is that a word? Probably not. But um, there's two in this category that would fit that. There's also two Bond villains in here. Um, also excellent, uh, excellent villains. But the two that stand out for me are Norman Bates and Hannibal Lecter. Uh, to me, Hannibal Lecter is is he's a more com- more complex than to say he's a villain. Yes, he is a cannibal. And is not, and is obviously a sick person, but he does help mm-hmm. Clarice Starling eventually catch yes. Buffalo Bill, who is the who is the scarier person in that film as a as a villain. And then the so it sounds like the evilness level is becoming our central focus criteria. Would you guys say that's correct? Seems like I, I, I think that's fair because even then, with Hannibal Lecter, with the success of films, they showed him as having a moral code. Mm-hmm. Yes, and we, which is. Very different from a lot of the the villains you see in most things. Um, and Blofeld, uh, who actually, if I recall, that was also Donald Pleasance, wasn't it? Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in many ways, it's a similar thing where it was more of a political game. It wasn't necessarily just about doing horrible things to horrible people for the sake of doing them. So the, I think the evil inspector does tend to trump a lot of, no pun intended, well, maybe a little bit intended. Uh, it does tend to... <laughs> It, it does tend to. Take hey, he has over. been in movies. He might win. Uh, <laughs> if nothing else, he won best special effects for making it look like he's been alive. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if we look at Norman Bates comparatively, even then, it's I would I would actually put him as more evil than Hannibal Lecter. But uh, he's also, I would agree with that. But he is literally a psycho. Yes, but he's also more sympathetic. That's the other side of it. Right. Because mm-hmm. it was a result of him being abused as a child by his mother and all this other stuff, and there is a, and he himself didn't know he was committing these crimes, because it was in the guise of his mother's personality that he was doing it. So he he didn't really even know he was doing it. That's Maybe true. on some level he did. So it's a it's a it's a mental health issue. Yeah, he's suffering a, psych- a yeah. series of psychotic breaks where he assumes the. He, I mean, he's constantly a split personality where he's talking to his own mother. So certainly, right. certainly, a doctor could argue. In court, that he that he would be uh, released as insane. He would be put in a mental institution as opposed to on death row. You, that that and could he, be argued. And he was in in Psycho Two. They they let him back out. So there you go. I, spoiler I, that's alert. True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if if you want a real spoiler, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Bane breaks Batman's back. Oh, what? What? Come on. Oh. 
Yeah. So let me ask you this. If we are taking, uh, if we're taking, the, if we're taking the notion of, I don't condone it, but I get it as, uh, a, an eliminating factor, can we also eliminate Alex Forrest from Fatal Attraction, who did everything for love? Uh, and Joan Crawford, who just doesn't like wire hangers? <laughs> Well, or or daughters. Well, you know what? I would I would eliminate Joan Crawford because she had she had some serious mental health issues. Also, yeah. um, there's a uh, there's a reviewer on the internet, uh, a guy by the name of Brad Jones, uh, the cinema snob. He he did a great review of uh, Mommy Dearest, and he makes a point that as much as people laugh at the No More Wire Hangers line, if you watch that whole scene, it is painfully unnerving, and mm-hmm. that performance is like actually very deeply disturbing. The line itself seems kind of silly, but when you watch it and realize this woman was completely unhinged and the only person there to deal with her is her like eight year old daughter, it, it's pretty frightening. I, it I made, might, uh, it made what, uh, Faye Dunaway a bit of a pariah in Hollywood to take down a legend like Joan Crawford the way she did. Oh yeah. And, but therein lies the key is that you have to, some, sometimes you, uh, a performance does that. I, Michael uh, Chiklis for years was blacklisted because of Wired, the uh, the film about um, John Belushi. Right. Like people actively kept him off TV and out of movies because they were so mad at him for even being in that film. Uh, that that is a risk you take. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So then, uh, all right. So here's who we have left under human criminals. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm leaving Cruella Deville on there because she did some terrible things to those puppies. Yeah. <laughs> Goldfinger, uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, and uh, Gold and Cruella Deville. Who's going to come out of this one on top? Hmm. I- I've not seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, but that's pretty. Uh, everything that's been said about him makes me think. I think he kind of has to win, and it's odd for me to say that with somebody who's from a film that I have not yet seen, but which now mm-hmm. I'm kind of afraid to watch. Which maybe makes him like. Which maybe makes him the clear and, and and present danger of this category for me of human criminals. I would uh, I would agree with that. So uh, so here is who we have in our first three categories. Uh, if this is amenable to you, gentlemen, sci-fi and fantasy villains: the Joker, horror monsters: Freddy, human criminals: Henry, portrait of a serial killer. All we right. good? We're good. I'm good with that. Yeah. All right. Now we're moving on to corrupt authority figures. Gordon Gecko has already been eliminated. Uh, and here is who is on this list. Stansfield from Lyon, the professional, uh, m- made famous by the sentence, everyone, everyone, everyone. Uh, That's a great sentence. And now we've got. Uh, Amon, how do you pronounce his name? Goeth? Goeth? Guta? I think it's Gert. Gert. Uh, from Schindler's List, which is, uh, which is, I believe, I guess, I mean, the movie is a factual story based on a real person. Um, that is, uh, as played by Ray Fiennes in the film Schindler's List. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it was a Oscar winner, wasn't he, for that? He was a nominee, not a winner. Nominee. Uh, Sergeant Hartman from Full Metal Jacket. That is the drill sergeant that, uh, that tries to whip, uh, whip private pile, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio into shape. Yes. Salieri from Amadeus, the subpar musician who ultimately kills Mozart. Uh, Nurse Ratched from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the horrific, uh, the horrific sadistic nurse in the, uh, mental ward. And Annie Wilkes from Misery, as played by Kathy Bates, who can forget her hobbling Bruce Willis, or uh, Bruce Willis, that was James the Conn. play that just happened. Yes. yes. James Conn. Did you guys know there was a Broadway version of this that just happened with Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf? No. I did not. Though, yeah, wait. but what a cool cast, huh? Yeah. I, I, that actually caught me off guard with Laurie Metcalf. I was like, oh. yeah. Yeah, uh, I know, because you're like, ooh, that's good. I thought you were thinking about hobbling Bruce Willis after Hudson Hawk. Don't How, you ever make fun of the movie Hudson Hawk. I just Hudson did. Hawk is an amazing film. <laughs> Doing a heist 
to oh. swing on a star so that you can you start singing it simultaneously so that you guys are in sync doing the things you need to do to rob a place come on mark i will grant you that it is great that they time out their crimes to songs i think that is very clever can you name one other thing about that movie you like danny no aiello. that is not the point wait what danny, was that danny aiello he is amazing danny aiello yeah all right they have great chemistry um what is it a james coburn in one of the final roles where he was physically active and beat the crap out of uh, Bruce Willis. Uh, he was a student of Bruce Lee, as you might remember, James uh, Coburn, not Bruce Willis. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but even the, the a lot of the, the subtle jokes, um, the twins, Ig and Oog, is what uh, Bruce Willis refers to them as. When they get shot later in the movie, the one that he calls Ig says Ig. That's the last time he makes it and says Oog when he gets shot. It's There's a lot of subtlety in that movie that's very underappreciated. And there's actually a man in this world uh, he appeared many years ago on, I think it was Dinner and a Movie on uh, TBS, where his actual job is he toured around college campuses explaining why Hudson Hawk was a great movie. <laughs> that, and that man is a great man. What a job. He is. Uh, oh. By the way, can I pitch you guys, since you mentioned James Coburn, one of my favorite movies uh, that's so much fun to watch that not a lot of people know about. Have you ever heard of a movie called The Last of Sheila? No. No. Not it is uh, Ten Little Indians – Updated Agatha Christie's Ten Little Indians updated to a 1970s yacht, and the overseer, like creator of the game, is played by uh, James Coburn, and he is brilliant in it. And the screenplay was written by Norman Bates himself, Anthony Perkins, and even though it is not a musical, Stephen Sondheim. Check out that movie; it's a lot of fun. There's no part of what you just said that I did not like. I'm interested. That was, yeah, it's that it is, is a really cool movie. <laughs> Uh, all right. So, uh, here are, uh, our, we've got our corrupt authority figures. Who are we liking in this one? I mean, who are we hating in this one? <laughs> well, as I said before, my stance on Gordon Gecko, obviously, uh, sure. Yeah. Just, Already eliminated. Don't you worry. Yeah. Simon. Yeah. That, 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 that was, a, that was a big one to me. Uh, Sergeant Hartman, I'd eliminate right off the bat because technically speaking, he's doing his job. Yeah. He's doing his job. And, uh, the story behind Arlie Ermey getting that role was that he, was hired as a technical advisor. He was asked to sh- what sort of things a drill instructor would say, and he went down, got into costume, stood in front of the uh, camera, and cursed into it for 15 minutes straight without repeating himself once. Wow. And when Stanley Kubrick saw that, he went, you, you, you you're the guy. We're, no, actor, wow. fired, you, do this. So I got to feel bad for that actor, though. Oh, oh yeah. You never want to be the guy that almost played somebody. Like the uh, what was it? The guy that got lead poisoning that was almost a Tin Man. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He. Uh, yeah. He was allergic to the paint. Yeah. Well, if, as we're eliminating them, I would like to. Uh, I'd like to add one in. Then looking at the the phrase "corrupt authority figures," you're right. Arlie Ermey was just doing his job in that movie. But I'll tell you who was a corrupt authority figure uh, was the warden in the Shawshank Redemption. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Although and one that I think was an oversight. Couldn't, couldn't on you my say part. that he's another guy who's motivated by money? Because really, everything he does is just to funnel money and and launder money into a bank account for himself. And certainly, he he abuses power within the prison. But it's ultimately he's ultimately a criminal that deserves to be inside because because he's stealing money. Right. True, true. Added, but if we're gonna bring up Shawshank, I feel like Clancy Brown's uh, the prison guard he played was would be an honorable mention there because. He was a pretty vicious creature unto himself, and he but didn't he gave really... him a beer on the roof. True, but I, I believe the phrase he had about losing one's teeth more or less does, it, it, it it outweighs the beer. I don't know. That's yeah. That's kind of an unpleasant thing to say to any human being. That's that's fair. <laughs> All right, so Shawshank Redemption added and eliminated. Yes, um, the yeah. two for me that stand out. One is Amon, mm. uh, Amon Gert, because he's like just a despicable creature. Obviously, for me, the fact that he's a Nazi knocks him up a, a ton of notches, but he's also just a cruel person. There are, there are people from that time who could say they were just following orders and it doesn't excuse anything that they did, but he is, is a sadistic animal who enjoys, you know, he'll, be having a conversation and then he picks up a rifle and then just it, because it's the morning time, he's taking shots and killing people in the concentration camp just because he can. He controls uh, the Jewish woman who's eventually freed and and goes with Schindler because he can. 
not, you know, he's been granted this power, which is already a, a corrupt thing in and of itself. And then he, he, he corrupts it even further and is perverted and, and twisted and evil about it. And also, we don't have a Nazi on this list yet. And if we're That's, doing any list of villains, there's got to be a Nazi on it, right? Sure. I, 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 that, that's a fair. That's a fair statement. That's one of those ones you never think you're going to hear in life, but that's definitely a fair statement. <laughs> you keep hoping you won't, but it, it yeah. keep. You keep hoping you, you never have to say the phrase. We need a Nazi right now. Yeah, exactly. It's just like we can't not have one. <laughs> this is Hollywood's fault. First, the love guru, and then bringing Nazis back. Just atrocity oh. after atrocity. But I, I also think Annie Wilkes is an interesting villain in that she obviously is is sick in some way, but you never see her as um as a sympathetic character she's always doing things that are evil for the for for uh, in service of her psychosis and that's what's unnerving about her is that she looks and acts like a sympathetic character that sweetness factor is so brutal it really is right. and and she it, it was always the little things with the way even the the uh the way they wrote the character and her performance the th- her not swearing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like, and right up until that final sequence when she starts swearing, and it, you're like, oh, oh, it's it reminds you that the the person that James Conn is dealing with isn't just a nurse or a fan; it is a very sick individual. Um, actually, actually, bringing it back up, the the film I mentioned earlier, Behind the Mask, uh, there's a scene in it where uh, he tells the film crew because he tells them what girl he's going after, uh, the main character Leslie Vernon. And he, his one rule is he says, you cannot talk to her. That, that messes everything up. You can't talk to her. And then at one point, the film crew tries to talk to her and they get sort of spooked out, out of it and they, they leave. And when they get outside, he's leaned up against their car and he says, do you want to have, pretend we just had the conversation we're about to have? Wow. And it, it's that whole thing because up to that point in the movie, he's very charismatic and friendly and, and playful and he's cracking jokes and all this stuff. And you're, he drives a Prius. Like it's all, all, all these things where you're like, oh, he's not that bad a guy. And he starts going back and forth with the woman that's interviewing him, and she says something that crosses him too far, and he grabs her by the face and just slams the back of her head up against the uh, the van, and it's like gets right in her face and right up in the grill, and it's like telling her, "We're not doing this right here. We're going to go." And it's that moment that really reminds you: this is a person who's telling them he's going to kill someone, like he's plotting this. This is not a good person, no matter how pleasant and friendly he might be. And it's the same thing with Annie Wilkes. No matter how pleasant or friendly she might be, oh, she pulled you out of the car and you know, saved you from the snow, all this stuff. It's like this is the woman that is holding you against your will, is going to eventually break both of your ankles with a sledgehammer, and will murder you if you do not write the story exactly as she wants it written. Like th- That's horrific. Yeah. No, that's – So is it more horrific – than a Nazi? Technically speaking, no, only because <laughs> – well, I, I'd say no because the once again, her, yeah. she has a psychosis. There's something wrong with her that yeah. could be explained by medical science. The thing that's wrong with someone who isn't just a Nazi but who takes it one step further where you're already in an extreme situation and you just go that extra mile not because you have to but because you can. Yeah. Everything mm-hmm. she did, she felt she had to do. In the same way she nursed James Conn back to health, she felt she had to break his ankles to keep him from leaving. She felt she had to, you know, threaten him so that he would write the story as she wanted it written. She never did anything really beyond what she thought she had to do. Whereas the whole point is that he, with the Nazis are that that was it. They went way beyond what, even if they were talking about, you were talking about conquering, you were talking about military, you were talking about even the guys who were quote unquote just doing their job. When you're just going, you know what? It's 1030. I just had my coffee. I think I'm going to shoot someone. Not because I have to, not because they're trying to mm-hmm. escape, because they're there. The most and chilling I can. scene in the movie. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. There, there's no, there's no motivation. It, it's merely, I have the freedom to do it, so I will. In that sense, um, I, I, I think you and I, I think all three of us are on the same page here, but I have one wrinkle in this category I want to throw in. Um, all right. Who I think is, is – uh, They're not wrinkles. They're scars. You're right. I have one – They're scars. One force lightning scar I want to throw in here, <laughs> um, and that is Calvin Candy from Django Unchained, um, who is a very similar – he's a mm-hmm. plantation owner and a slave owner. And he runs a slave uh, fighting – you know, he, he raises slaves to fight and kill one another 
he murders he murders them and has sex with them and does whatever he wants because he can and because he believes he's a you could say it's you can even make the same the same parallel between them the nazi uh dominates people because he believes he's a superior man calvin candy uh, subjugates and dominates his slaves because he believes he's a superior man and maybe doesn't believe that his slaves are are men at all but are but are animals to him so here's here's the thing about that character though to me and this is going to sound completely unfair and i know he's a wonderful actor um <laughs> he he's a little too pretty for me to hate that much i don't think that that i i feel like when I was watching that movie, it's every, and I know it's terrible to say, every time, uh, every time DiCaprio plays a villain, I still see like Romeo and the guy from Titanic. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't feel as scary to me, even though what he's doing is horrific. He doesn't chill me. Mark, are you saying what? you don't want to date Ray Fiennes? You don't like a, a nice, ne- uh, like pointy faced, European <laughs> handsome man. I will only date Ray Fiennes if he's wearing his Voldemort makeup or his bowler hat and fancy pinstripe suit from the Avengers. <laughs> you have a sickness that is deep within you. I, I was going to not bring, the I was British bring up movie, Bruce, the Avengers. I mean, yeah, there you go. It was Bruce. that extra. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that, but that's, a, that's an example of uh, Ray Fiennes. Though he's he's demonstrated that there are some actors that I don't think can that at least for particular roles or styles of roles they can't really outact what they present mm-hmm. and, and, and yeah. it, it's un, it's unfair but i it goes back to like the uh the the ben affleck is batman thing it's not that ben yeah, affleck isn't, isn't he's not a good actor no one was saying that well some people were saying that but that wasn't the the totality of the argument I think he's it a was fine actor. yeah but it's he's not batman mm-hmm. being a good batman and being a good actor aren't the same thing um punisher war zone is a terrible movie in every sense of the word that being said, Ray Stevenson looked like the Punisher. Mm-hmm. The way they wrote the character was very accurate to the comic book. They gave him an actual comic book villain in Jigsaw. And I couldn't say it was an inaccurate translation of the comic. It was very accurate. Does that make for a good movie? No, not always. Sometimes, and, and that's what a lot of screenwriters run into when they try and translate, say, a comic book or a, a traditional novel or a TV show or whatever into a film format is that it, being accurate might not make it good, and being good might not always be enough. So in the case of, of Leonardo DiCaprio, he falls in that category where it's not necessarily that he's a bad actor. Um, it's that he's Leonardo DiCaprio, and you're going to see yeah. him in a certain light. And while there are certain roles he can play and do a great job at, uh, The Revenant win an Oscar for, and there are some roles where – he looks out of place no matter how good a job he's technically doing. He's not necessarily doing anything wrong. But uh, a great example of this, actually, uh, the film Flight of the Intruder, Mm -hmm. uh, which was like a a military drama involving the Air Force. The original cut of the film, there's a scene where it's big trial and everything. The door is open and in walks a a pilot who's going to testify. And it's Ed O'Neill from Married to Children. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. This film was made in 1990 when – Married to Children was just sort of getting to the height of its popularity. It's starting to get really popular. Mm-hmm. And when they test screened it, it got met with laughs. Yeah. yeah so, so, yeah. Because it's Al, oh, it's Al Bundy. Hey, uh. And they're like, we want this very serious, tense, dramatic scene. And we have people laughing because it's Al Bundy. And they had to cut his scene out of the movie and recast it and reshoot it. And it, no one was questioning that Ed O'Neill was a good actor. No one was saying he did a bad job. It was just that he was the wrong guy for that role because no one saw Ed O'Neill, the actor, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, the you know star of Modern Family because obviously he hadn't done those things yet. But that wasn't what people saw. People saw Al Bundy and that immediately uh, – Anthony Perkins, who we mentioned earlier, had the same problem. It didn't matter what movie he did. Everyone saw Norman Bates and he was sort of stuck in that role for a long time. Mark Hamill, he was – uh, Luke Skywalker forever until he started doing voice acting work, at which point he was able to build a reputation as being an actual good actor because you weren't caught up in the fact you were seeing Luke Skywalker. You were just listening to his performance. And now he's partially responsible for our head contender in the sci-fi and fantasy category. Yes, yeah. his, his performance as a Joker. Fun fact about that, just because I, I like sidebarring because I'm terrible with focus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you fit right in, I'm telling you. Yeah, the, uh, we have never just topic covered. 
Mark Hamill was not the original voice for the Joker on Batman the Animated Series. Who was it? No? No, the original voice for the Joker was uh, Tim Curry. Oh. Really? And apparently his performance was so frightening. This is There are no audio tapes to anyone's knowledge of his actual performance. But apparently his performance was so frightening that when the executives at Fox heard it, they told um, Paul Dini and, and Bruce Timms and all them, no. Just no. No, we can't. <laughs> wow. Not someone else. No. This is, for God's can't. sake, this is for children. Yeah. Pretty much. That was, that was kind of the response. And, wow. and Hamill had been hired to play a, a – he was, he's a Batman fan, so it was actually he, – he wanted to be on the show. And he had been hired to just do a one-off for a different character, uh, just a mob boss. And they brought him back in to read for the Joker. And he – by all accounts, uh, uh, Andrea Romano, the, the – the uh, legend, the the legend that she is, said she has never seen as perfect a reading as he gave. Well, like that. That's why he's where he is. A, le- a legend. A legend is born again as mm-hmm. the, as the Joker. So okay. So so we're saying out of this category, we're going to take a- Amon Gert. Is that fair to yep. say? Amon Gert. Are we saying that name right? Amon Gert. We are now. Right. Great. There we go. Uh, all right. So here are now. Does anybody before we uh, before we talk about these four? Does anyone want to add anyone back in that has been eliminated? This is our opportunity to champion one that that's been cut. I like the list we have. I'm not going to add anybody back in. I, I, but I, I pass to you. I, I'm okay with the list as is. I, I think it's a solid one. Same here. I think we have a good final four. Great. So uh, our final four are The Joker, Freddy Krueger, Henry from Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, and Amon Gert from Schindler's List. The four most evil characters that we could find in cinema. Because that is what this has become. This is not, this is no longer the best movie villain. This is the evilest movie villain. Okay. Hmm, so that's what do we look at? Who did the most damage? I I think I know I think I know who I th- I know who I feel is is the best movie villain which conversely is the most evil character of of these four. Um do you guys feel confident do you have a favorite right out of the gate? Is what I'm asking. Simon, do you? Uh not necessarily a favorite. I've got I've got some points and counterpoints with a lot of them because you could you could make the same sort of idea about the uh, the Joker as with Freddy Krueger where he's completely morally reprehensible but is beloved and that almost makes him more evil than say a character that's reprehensible like no one's going to defend the nazi i mean no no one who you'd have any respect for anyway right. no one's gonna be like well gert was just doing his job you know he's yeah. he's a nice guy he's a good family no one's gonna do that no. so it's almost like you're not gonna see any kids dressed up as him on halloween to bring that back to cultural impact i mean if we really break it down mm-hmm. there are only two characters out of the four that had actual cultural impact to the point where people dress up as them and and you know, cosplay, Halloween, toys, movies. You know, you, you can buy I, I'm right now I'm I'm in my apartment. I'm looking I have no less than let's see, one, two, three, four four jokers in my eyeline right now. <laughs> I, in my head, I've got I've got like nine Henry Portrait of a serial killers. <laughs> That, I'm not even mad about that. I actually, I would yield. I would yield to that right now. I was, I would give you 100 percent of my vote just because you had nine separate articles from that movie. That's just impressive. I can't even. I can't even be upset. And as always, when I'm out in public, I am dressed in full Freddy makeup and costume. There you go. Uh, so let me yeah. let me let me throw this out as well. Then, if evil was the criteria to get to the finals, and it sounds like uh, Freddy and the Joker are. Are the being the icons that they are, is there something to be said for how much fun it is to watch them? Cause there is something fun about watching these, like when you don't think about the fact that Freddie was a child molester. Oh yeah. Uh, well, when it, you, when you just see these sort of Robert England's wacky character and every version of the Joker, these, th- there's something to be said for the fun of it. Yes. And, and that's, I think, really the defining factor because if you look at Henry and Gert, it, there, there's nothing defendable about them. You, you don't really – you don't watch them and think these are – you know, you can't be sympathetic. And beyond that, you can't, you can't enjoy them. You can't look at them and go, oh, man, that was so funny what he just said there. Oh, that was so cool the way he did that. You're like, no, this guy is an absolute monster. He can't draw you in with that same – that same sort of charisma that the Joker and Freddy have, which as awful as they are respectively and as many horrible things mm-hmm. as they've both done, 
they're almost more insidious because you don't necessarily think about it all the time how bad they are. Yeah, I I would agree with that 100%. There is something – it's almost sneaky. You know how bad they are but you're still drawn to them like like um, like women who like wanted to marry the Menendez brothers back in the day. Like I know he's bad but there's just something about him that like you – there it's – it's frightening to think that they can. It wasn't just out. women, buddy. <laughs> do you know how many? Uh, do you know how many letters I sent sprayed with Drakkar? Is, is that why you have that haircut in your picture? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So now, is it? Uh, would you guys say it's fair to say it's coming down to the Joker versus Freddy? Yes, I think that's fair. So the criteria that we uh, originally set forth: evil, which is what got them to this point; power. Merits of the films, and in the case of the Joker, other media, and impact on society. Well, I think I think in the case of evil, it's hard for me to top Freddy because he molested and murdered children, then sold his soul before he was killed so that he could continue to kill children and just to punish the people who killed him. He said, okay, I'm going to mm-hmm. kill all your children. Well, what were you doing before we burned you? It's not like you're the innocent one here. <laughs> this is a continuation. Well, so we're supposed yeah. to go into our dream- dreams and burn you again in that dumb boiler room you live in? Way more evil than the Joker, I think. That, yes. that's, that's definitely – I think he's definitely – he wins the evil category hands down. That, that's not really one we can argue. Yeah. Now let's talk power. Freddy's power – is a a supernatural power, but it only affects a few people. The Joker's power is a human power, but it affects the entirety of Gotham City. And you you have to be asleep to be susceptible to Freddy murdering you. So however long you're asleep is when you're vulnerable, whereas the Joker can strike at any time. Mm-hmm. True. Though, though technically, uh, as we saw in the inadvertently – uh, homoerotic film that was uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, um, he can actually affect you in the real world as well, even if you're not asleep. Uh, that, there, there's actually a, a whole uh, – I think there's a Kickstarter to fund a documentary studying the, uh, the homoerotic subtext of Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. This sounds like a uh, this sounds like a nerd night presentation waiting to happen. Yeah, and it's not. It, and the funny thing is, it's not even. In, it doesn't even feel inaccurate. You're like, you're almost. It's one of those ones where you're like, wow, this. You mean that that doesn't already exist? This seems really obvious. It's <laughs> it's it's one of those ones where you're like, well, yeah, it's it's a very odd film in a lot of that regard. Uh, that that it, it, you almost have to ask if that wasn't how could that not have been intentional, basically. But the point being is that he he does come out of the dream in part two and and does kill some people at that party when he possesses the uh, the young man that he's tormenting throughout the course of it. But at the same time, that's one movie out of six. I mean, or right. eight now, I guess. Yeah. That's not really, that's not nearly as, as impactful as the uh, one, you know, one, one eighth of his, of his career versus the entirety of the Jokers. But the, the ability to not kill him. Well, that they always seem to figure out a way to kill him, but ostensibly he cannot be killed. Does that give him more power than the Joker? Sort of, but the Joker's also proven he can't be killed either. Good point. Yeah. Be- because be- he's the best villain and DC Comics isn't stupid. Well, well, well actually, don't no, scratch it. The Joker has died one time. I forgot about that. He has legitimately died one singular time. And that was really? in uh, Dark Knight. And then Night- Robin took over as Joker? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, actually. Dark Knight Returns. Uh, oh. he, he, uh, Batman cripples him and he uses the last bit of his strength to sever his own spinal cord by twisting his neck and he dies. So, but he almost died in defiance of Batman, which makes it even meaner than living because as he said, that no one's ever going to know that you didn't really kill me. Even on his way out, he did the meanest thing he could possibly do to Batman, which is take the guy who'd been built up as, oh, he might beat criminals up, but he never kills them. Uh, if you ever have a chance to watch it, it's actually on YouTube. You can watch it for free. It's called Holy Musical Batman. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a theater troupe out of uh, Chicago did a musical about Batman, and they make the it's actually really wonderful. But they make the joke about how you know he doesn't kill anyone, but you know he'll cripple you for life. He'll, <laughs> <laughs> Batman's like, oh, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to break both of yeah. your legs and and your spinal bat or your spinal cord and your your arms, and you're going to be a quadriplegic for the rest of your life. Yeah. You're going to be good a luck wiping yourself. Yeah, but 
but you're alive. Yeah, he's like, I'm yeah. going to put you both in a wheelchair because I'm Batman. It's a huge musical number. Everybody oh, loved yeah. it. <laughs> it, it. That's actually not far off. I don't know if you've seen it, but that's not far off. I don't. I, man, I think I missed a whole theater scene in Chicago that would have been perfect man. for me. Can't he just sing all of Phantom of the Opera songs? They're all about night. <laughs> he could, but it, he actually does have one called Dark, Sad, Lonely uh, Night. So it's it's about how sad he is because he has no friends. <laughs> It, it's really uh, – it's the same people have done uh, the the Harry Potter musical series where they did all the oh, Harry Potter sure. films as musicals. Darren Chris, right. Wasn't, uh, wasn't that what made Darren Chris famous? Uh, probably. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, who's coming out of power on top, Joker or Freddy? <sighs> I am I could go either way on it, but I'm going to have to go with Joker. Uh, okay. Just because of nothing else, he maximizes his power as a human being, whereas Freddy is sort of – at the behest of the dream gods or whatever it was he sold his soul to. Mm-hmm. So he, does, he doesn't necessarily have his own power. He has their powers. Uh, that would be my side of it. Now, the final two, I feel like it's it, – correct me if I'm wrong. These feel like a shoe in for the Joker. Merits of the media and impact on society. Maybe this is because I go to a lot of Comic-Cons. I think Merits of the Films is a little easier. Uh, it's unfortunate because the original Nightmare on Elm Street is is a wonderful movie. It's very well done. A lot of the special effects were pretty groundbreaking at the time. The uh, mm-hmm. the wall effect where uh, he's sort of pushing through the wall. And, and they did that at the time with, I believe it was a sheet of uh, Lycra. And yeah, light. It was like pantyhose, right? Yeah. Whereas I think when they did the remake, they did it with, of course, CGI. Right. But it, it, there's a lot in the movie that's very impressive. I believe it's also the first film appearance of uh, young Johnny Depp. Yes. Uh, yes. So notable for that as well. Obviously, as the series went on, it became campier, a little bit more cartoonish, lower budget. And it seemed like they were they were less – almost like the Saw movies where it became less about the storyline and more about, hey, what silly way can we kill people this time? Saw just became gore porn. It did. I, I I actually sat down and thought about this one day because I, of course, have mental issues. I <laughs> if you if you edited the films to just tell the actual story, you could get it down to about four movies, four and a half movies, maybe. Now, hear me out on this. Okay. Number one is a standalone. Like number mm-hmm. one, all the way through is a movie. Number two, all the way through is a movie. So those are two complete films that. Set up a story and advance a story. Part three and four happen at the same time. The actual game, quote unquote, that happens in both those movies is really pointless. And it's just serving to bring both these characters together who ultimately have no real value in the story. They both die. Um, it's only, I mean, uh, the guy in part three is only there to kill Jigsaw after his, uh, he's already terminal with cancer. Um, and the uh, the cop is only there to show up and find out that uh, Costas Mandalore is the one who's sort of taken up the. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling the Saw movies for anyone. I, that's not something. Look, I, that they spoiled I'd themselves. Yeah, it feels like Costas Mandalore might have done that. He might. Hey, <laughs> hey. his brother Luis was amazing in the film Champions with Ken Shamrock. But <laughs> that's true. There you go. All right, gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, we are getting off of topic. Always. Imp- <laughs> Impact on society, Freddy or Joker? Uh, Joker. Yeah, it's the Joker. Joker. Easily. That, that's the one. You, you're, you're not going to find a whole lot of Freddy Krueger t-shirts year-round. Like, you'll see the, the glove come up every year on Halloween, but year-round, you could go into beyond comic book stores. You can go to any toy store, any Walmart, any uh, any comic book shop, and you'll find Joker uh, collectibles, Joker comics. I mean, it, it's a character that is really sort of transcended even the medium it was created in to the point where you might not know anything about the comic book industry. You might not know anything about even the movies, but you know, the character, the Joker, if I showed you a picture of him, right. you know exactly who he is. And I don't know that you could say the same thing about Freddy Krueger. And particularly with the younger generation, I feel like that's the other thing. There's been no reiteration of Freddy Krueger other than the 2010, I believe remake. And mm-hmm. yeah. even then you're not really, it's, it's more something, you know, you might know exists, but you're not necessarily thinking about. Whereas with the Joker, Every few years, he's going to pop up without fail, whether it's Heath Ledger or Jared Leto or Mark Hamill doing the voice again or my personal favorite unsung Joker, John DiMaggio, uh, Bender yes. Bending Rodriguez for, for those That's of you right. not familiar. Yes. He did it. Under the Red Hood, he does a wonderful job. Uh, d- does not get a lot of credit for that. but Very scary Joker that he does. Very like almost understated and like w- just – John oh, is what? a fantastic actor and that is a in- incredible performance. 
Oh, the uh, when, when they go to visit him in the cell, and he's the whole, the way he's just so polite. Like, you look good. Mm-hmm. You've been working out. Just, it, just <laughs> as as though that's the sort of thing the Joker would. And it, you feel like that's that's how the Joker would react. He wouldn't be angry. He wouldn't be oh my nemesis. Uh, he wouldn't be wringing his hands in anger. He would he would be talking to him like it was just a polite day. Ultimately, Freddy's never going to have the same staying power. Like the original movies might, but. They're not going to be viewed with the same sort of reverence as, as the Batman franchise will long term. I will say this then. I couldn't be happier that what ultimately tipped the scale in favor of our winner of best movie villain uh, is a performance as that villain delivered by the Thrilling Adventure Hour's own Johnny D. That's right. So uh, that makes me very happy. That's right. Um Oh, yes. And we've, uh, so it sounds like we've determined who our, uh, who our best movie villain is. That's right. So that means, uh, it, it, the only thing left is for me to say, people of the world, do you want to know how we got this decision? My daddy was a podcasting man <laughs> and he worked his way through all the movie villains, the, the good guys and the bad guys. And he discovered that there's only one villain who's insidious, who's had an impact on pop culture, and who has everybody losing their minds. And that is the Joker, who is the worst movie villain, which makes him the best movie villain, because he's the most evil movie villain of them all. <laughs> Asked and answered. That was terrifying. Uh, have you been preparing that the whole time or did, <laughs> like, like, did you have that? Did you have that loaded up? Were you just waiting for the opportunity to do that? Like hoping it'd be the Joker or was that all on the fly? That I'm just was curious. all on the fly. I promise you it did not. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I am, I'm, I am impressed. That was beautiful. That was a thing yeah. of beauty. Well, sir, yeah. I thank you. And we were both impressed and honored to have had you on the show. Simon, thanks for, for being a part of this and, and talking nerd with us. Oh, it, it was a pleasure to be here, and uh, anytime you'd like me back, I'd be glad to do it. Thank you. And where can people reach out and find you online? Uh, I can be found on Twitter and uh, Instagram. My handle is uh, at GotchStyleWWE. Um, those are those are pretty much the two places to find me. Uh, you can on Twitter. I'm usually just picking fights with people. I have no reason to acknowledge the existence of, and <laughs> I, I do that a lot. I, you know, some people they say they're above it. No, I will. I will pick a fight with a twelve-year-old who says that I suck. I will absolutely pick a fight with them. Um, they actually have several fans. Uh, you can you'll probably see them pop up every once in a while who ex- are my fans specifically because I argued with them until they liked me. You're not only a great guest because you know pop culture and you love it, but also you've played a villain on television for some time now. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and, and it's it's funny because it's the, it's the little things you don't you you realize. Everything and it's part of the reason why I tend to look at a lot of stuff contextually when it comes to villainy, mm-hmm. is because I realized it, that something that will make someone cheer you if they like you is the exact same thing that will make them boo you if they hate you. If you really look at any villain, you could frame their. That's why I tend to do it a lot. You could frame their actions as being heroic to someone. Aiden English, if people like him, my tag team partner, when he sings and he's a, he's a very good singer, they'll cheer. But if they don't like us, regardless of you know that same that same song. Look at look at the new day actually who we feud with uh, Xavier Woods, uh, uh, Kofi Kingston, and Big E. Mm-hmm. They're they're doing nothing different than when the audience was booing them, but it's perception. If you enjoy what they're doing and you perceive it as heroic, it doesn't matter if it's the same stuff they were doing when you were booing them six months earlier. There's no difference. It's it's merely how you interpret their actions. Thank you for talking a little bit of wrestling with me because as you Not, know, I'm a fan. I, I do know that's actually how we met. Was uh, met you at. Uh, it was Raw, wasn't it? In it Los was. Angeles. It sure was. So. Also, the the young man that played Ice Cube in uh in uh the the NWA movie was there as well. Yes, O'Shea Jackson Jr., the son of Ice Cube, played Ice Cube. He he is the son of Ice Cube. I did he, not know he that. He is I, the I, son of Ice Cube. Yeah. He and, he and I had a brief conversation about A and W root beer, but that was about it. <laughs> Look at that. You had a conversation with O'Shea Cube. Yeah, <laughs> I did. You see, if you told me it was O'Shea Cube, then I'd be like, "Oh, that's obvious. Right. That makes sense." Yeah. It's the Emilio Estevez Martin Sheen thing all over again. Exactly. We 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 have lots of uh, lots of other topics to cover on this show. Xavier Woods came on the show. Simon Gotch came on the show. Uh, let's see if any of the other WWE wrestlers are man enough to show up on our show and tackle a topic with us here. 
uh, in the, let's say, uh, ring, right? This, sure. This is a, this is a studio. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, so please reach out to us on Twitter, uh, at we got this tweets or check us out on the maximum fund subreddit. There is probably a flame war happening right now. You can also find us on Facebook forward slash we got this podcast or you can email us at we got this podcast at gmail.com. I want to thank Christian Duaneus who is on the board here at Max Fun. Uh, we'd also like to thank our regular producer Ken Plume, our graphic designer designer Uri Kelman. We'd like to thank our researcher Kate McManus and of course our QA engineer Jen Alba. And thanks as always to our musicians Mike Furman and Jonathan Dinerstein for our award-winning theme song and score respectively and most importantly thank you to you our listeners. We have such a blast doing this every episode and it is because of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For Hal Lublin, I'm Mark Gagliardi. And for Mark Gagliardi, I'm Hal Lublin. And don't worry everybody. We got this. We got this. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported.